Terror hits New York, New Jersey, and Minnesota this past week. What is fueling these attacks and how to combat Islamic radicalism? Counterterrorism expert Dr. Walid Ferez is here. And while a Christian genocide rages on in the Middle East, why aren't these refugees being admitted into Europe and the U.S.? And who is coming? New Jersey Congressman Chris Smith is here to discuss. And finally, she's a three-time Olympian and gold medal winner. Now a wife and mother, Dominique Dawes is here to talk about gymnastics, motherhood, and the faith that informs it all. The world over starts right now. Now, from Washington, D.C., Raymond Arroyo. A warm welcome to all of you joining us in the United States and the world over. Dominique Dawes, Walid Ferris, Congressman Chris Smith are all straight ahead. If you'd like to comment on tonight's show or if you have a question, I'll be live tweeting throughout. You can find me on Twitter at Raymond Arroyo or you can email me at worldover at EWTN.com. Here's the brief news from the world over this week. North Carolina's governor has declared a state of emergency after consecutive nights of protests turned violent. Protesters took to the streets in response to a shooting death of an allegedly armed black man by an officer who was also black. What started as a peaceful prayer vigil on Wednesday night turned into an angry march and a night of violence. A protester was shot by a civilian and critically wounded as people charged police in riot gear trying to protect a hotel in downtown Charlotte. Both presidential candidates lamented the strife. Democrat Hillary Clinton said the Charlotte police shooting and the one earlier in Tulsa added two more names to a long list of African Americans killed by police officers. It's unbearable, she said, and it needs to become intolerable. Republican Donald Trump called for racial unity, as there seems to be, as he called it, a lack of spirit between the black and the white. It's a terrible thing that we're witnessing." End quote. And new jihadi terror attacks in New York, New Jersey, and Minnesota have raised new concerns over security and migration policies. Ahmed Khan Rahami, an Afghan-born U.S. citizen, has been charged with detonating a pipe bomb in New Jersey on Saturday morning and a pressure cooker bomb in New York City's Chelsea neighborhood later that night. 31 people were injured in the New York blast. It was incidentally a door away from a Catholic church. A second pressure cooker bomb left in Manhattan didn't explode. In a bloody journal recovered by investigators, Rahami made references to Osama bin Laden, American-born jihadi cleric Anwar al-Awlaki, and the Fort Hood terrorist, Nadal Hassan. And in St. Cloud, Minnesota, Somali native Dahir Adan was killed by police this past Saturday after he stabbed nine people at a shopping mall. None of the victims were mortally wounded. An Islamic State-run news agency claimed that the attacker was, quote, a soldier of the Islamic State who had heeded the group's calls for attacks in countries that are anti-Islamic state. On the heels of the latest attacks, the migration and refugee crisis took center stage at the U.N. General Assembly in New York. Leaders from the 193 member states took part in the first-ever summit on refugees. In the end, the U.N. approved a declaration aimed at providing a more coordinated and humane response to the refugee crisis. It has sparked divisions from Africa to Europe and strained resources in destination countries. Included in the proposal are developing a standardized response to refugee situations, improving work and education opportunities, and campaigns to combat xenophobia. According to the UN, there are approximately 21 million refugees, 3 million asylum seekers, and 41 million migrants worldwide. And the war in Syria appears to have taken a turn for the worst after the collapse of a negotiated ceasefire between 
top U.S. and Russian officials. Each side blamed the other at a fractious United Nations Security Council meeting on Wednesday. Russia and Syria have vehemently denied allegations that they targeted a convoy of humanitarian aid going to rebel-held areas in Aleppo. Twenty civilians were killed in suspected air-to-ground strikes. And the U.S. is denying that it intentionally targeted Syrian troops in an airstrike this past week. In the meantime, the Syrian president has declared the ceasefire is over and warplanes have set rebel strongholds ablaze. U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry and Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov returned to negotiations on Thursday. And back on the campaign trail, Donald Trump is looking to strengthen his lagging numbers among Catholic voters. This week, the Trump campaign unveiled a heavyweight list of Catholic advisors to the Republican presidential nominee. Those Roman faithful who have signed on to support Trump include former Pennsylvania Senator Rick Santorum, Kansas Governor Sam Brownback, former Oklahoma Governor Frank Keating, Jim Nicholson, the former Republican national chairman and ambassador to the Vatican, Tom Monahan, founder of Domino's Pizza, Mary Madeline, and National Catholic Prayer Breakfast founder Joe Sella. Sella is the Trump campaign's chief liaison for Catholic affairs, and he joins us now by phone. Joseph, thank you for being with us. Hello, Raymond. Thanks very much. Good to be on. Joe, what does this mean? And according to reports, you signed a letter during the primaries with other Catholic leaders claiming that Trump was unfit for office. What happened? Well, uh, I, I'm happy to say that I'm happily supporting Mr. Trump. I'm volunteering for him and will be voting for him. Uh, there's been a sincere change of heart and mind um, uh, on the concerns expressed in the, in the primary that have been allayed due to a fuller understanding of how committed Mr. Trump is to the issues and policies of uh, greatest concern to Catholics, and certainly his uh, commitment to uh, judicial appointments, uh, being those who uh, will uh, uh, interpret the law rather than legislate from the bench. And, and certainly complementing all of that is the great selection of uh, Governor Mike Pence as his running mate and the hiring of uh, excellent uh, senior staff. Uh, the, the top three happen to be uh, Catholic, by the way. Okay. According to recent polls, Joe Sella, Mr. Trump is down 23 to 27 points with Catholics overall. Now, I spoke to a pollster the other day, and he said Catholics are breaking for Clinton more than any other group. Even the Pew survey has mass going Catholics. 57% are supporting Hillary Clinton, 38% Trump. How do you close that gap? Well, I, I, that, that is, uh, as we all know, uh, polling, polls are snapshots in time, and they're moving. They're always moving, and I think that information is, is a bit dated and uh, uh, very encouraging signs on, on how uh, working class uh, blue collar uh, uh, Catholics, even Democrats, are, are swinging uh, Mr. Trump's way because once they dial into the issues of, of uh, greatest concern um, and uh, it, contrasting with what uh, Hillary Clinton would represent, uh, her presidency would represent, uh, the choice to be more stark. Joe Sella, thank you for being with us, and we'll be keeping our eye on your Catholic advisory group. Thank you. Mourners gathered on Tuesday in Veracruz, Mexico, to remember two priests who were found dead on Monday. The bodies of the two Mexican priests were discovered, their hands bound by their priestly stoles. This after they were kidnapped from their parish on Sunday. A driver employed by the parish was also abducted, but later found unharmed. State officials said five men participated in the abductions, and one of the suspects' identities is known. The motive for the murders is not. The city where the priests served have been the scene of drug-related and gang violence for years. During the last four years in Mexico, 14 priests have been murdered. And Father Gabriel Amorth, perhaps better known as the Vatican Exorcist, died this past Friday at the age of 91. Hundreds of faithful paid tribute and attended his funeral mass on Monday. Father Amorth, who had served as the official exorcist for the Diocese of Rome since 1985, 
drew international attention for his outspoken warnings about the rising danger of diabolical influence in modern society. He had often complained that Catholic bishops were negligent in responding to these dangers and insisted that satanic influence is more prevalent than commonly understood. Last year, he said, quote, ISIS is Satan. Things first happen in the spiritual realms, then they're made concrete on this earth. Biblically speaking, we are in the last days and the beast is working furiously, end quote. Preceding his death, he had been hospitalized for several weeks due to complications from pneumonia. May Father Amorth rest in peace. And the Franciscan who for 12 years served as Custis of the Holy Land is the new apostolic administrator of the Latin Patriarchate of Jerusalem. Father Pier Battista Pizzaballa was ordained an archbishop this past week. Latin Patriarch Fouad Thual retired in July. Archbishop Pizzaballa will oversee the diocese until a new patriarch is chosen. He says his primary role will be to promote dialogue among the many Christian denominations in the Holy Land. Archbishop Pizzaballa has appeared with us several times, and we wish him the very best. And the Catholic Church in America is about to hold its first national gathering to honor those in the food and hospitality industry, and the setting couldn't be more perfect. New Orleans, Louisiana. The Table Foundation is putting on a fundraiser and the first ever Olive Mass. Joining me to tell us about it is the host of EWTN's Savoring Our Faith and founder of the Table Foundation, Father Leo Patalingag. Father, why did you feel an Olive Mass was needed? Well, simply because uh, we need to celebrate the reality of the hard work and almost the vocation of the professionals in the food and faith industry. St. Teresa of Avila said, if you want to find God, find him amidst the pots and the pans. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I think I know the answer to this, but why was New Orleans chosen? <laughs> because that's where you come from, Raymond. Yeah, no, but really because it. the reality of faith and food is so oftentimes celebrated there, and we also have working with us, celebrity chef and his wife, John Besh. And so they served as a perfect vehicle to, to create a, a buzz and an excitement. And so we just thought that New Orleans was a fantastic place for this inaugural mass. Well, I could not agree more. And, and Chef Besh, of course, is so known. You know, we just did a documentary on Christmas time in New Orleans, and he talked about the family table, the importance of the family table. And it actually made me think a lot of, of your work, Father Leo. So thank you for what you're doing. We will update people on this Mass. And uh, for more info on the dinner, there's a fundraising dinner the night before, and the Mass itself and how you can get tickets, they can all be found at the thetablefoundation.org. Click on the Olive Mass. It's on the top right-hand side of the page. Father Leo, thanks again for being here. And before we go to the break, two more big events to tell you about. If you are in D.C., Maryland, or Virginia, I'm going to be at the National Book Festival on September 24th. I'm so excited. I'll be talking about Will Wilder and signing books, and it's free, so come see us. And for those of you in New York, I'm hosting a very special live story-oriented conversation in the city with best-selling author of the book Wonder, R.J. Palacio. We'll be at the Sheen Center on Sunday, October 2nd. This is going to be a great event for tickets. Go to thesheencenter.org, sheencenter.org, or you can visit RaymondArroyo.com for all the details. They're at the bottom of the page. When we return with recent terror attacks in New York and Minnesota, are we seeing a new phase in radical Islam's war on the West? Counterterrorism expert Dr. Walid Fares will tell us the world over continues in a moment. Stay right there. Now, once again, Raymond Arroyo. Welcome back to the World Over Live. This past week, we've seen crude but coordinated terror attacks in New York, as well as a stabbing rampage in Minnesota. As these incidents mount, how is radical Islam's jihad against the West changing? For analysis, I'm joined by advisor to the Anti-Terrorism Caucus, 
of the House of Representatives and a foreign policy advisor to Donald Trump. Welcome back to the program, Dr. Walid Ferris. Dr. Ferris, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Um, I want to start with uh, this Ahmad Rahami. He claims that he, or it appears, that he is just a lone wolf. People are saying he's off, he radicalized himself. He's not attached to any cell. Does that matter? Well, it doesn't matter in the sense that does a drop of rain uh, com is, uh, acts completely different from the, uh, the, the cloud, from mm -hmm. the rain. Basically, in the sense that he did not come to this alone. He has been indoctrinated. No jihadi is not indoctrinated. No jihadi is born with PhD in, 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 in mm -hmm. jihadi studies, what have you. So the problem is not the individual. That's not his life. Once he crossed into jihadism, he's part of the pool. Mm. We're going to get into this a little later with, with uh, Congressman Chris Smith. But the notion that we have an American citizen, and this is, this is a pattern we're seeing, an American citizen plotting a terror act against fellow citizens. Is this the world we're just living in now? Is this the new front of this terror? Yes, yes, Raymond. You and I have discussed this for the last five, six years, yep. that eventually the jihadists are going to penetrate our civil society. Mm -hmm. so they don't have to come in from outside. No, no, it's here. over. The, the Muhammad Atta of the 9-11 era is gone. Mm -hmm. What we have right now, at, at least since 2009, with the, you know, the Fort Hood uh, perpetrator, uh, Major Hassan, so, all the way till now, we're talking about American citizens, but in their mind, they are jihadists first. Hmm. I want to play this for you. This is President Obama. He's addressing the terror attacks in New York and New Jersey, as well as the knife attack in Minnesota. Here's what he had to say. Meanwhile, while all this is going on in New York and New Jersey, we're also focused on the stabbing attack at the shopping mall in Minnesota. Uh, at this point, we see no connection between that incident and what happened here in New York and New Jersey. The president says there's no connection. Is that accurate? Well, how can it be that there's no connection within one body? I mean, these jihadists, when they cross into the other side, believe that they're doing the action because they are part of a larger body. So obviously, every action by these extremists, by these terrorists, should be in Minnesota, in Maryland, or in New York, are all connected. They're connected by ideology. The ideology connects but, but, them. But how do you track, how do you look for, how do you anticipate these individuals in their basements reading this data, watching the videos of Osama bin Laden? Uh, how, how do you, you forecast this so that law enforcement can intervene? Two things. Okay. Number one, the administration, the Obama administration, has banned any use of the only thing that connects everybody else, again, the ideology. So how can we educate the public? I mean, we should have had leaders such as President Obama and congressional leaders going on national TV and telling the public this is the enemy, this is the ideology, this is the way you would identify them. Now the Europeans have started to do that. Mm. President of France, Prime Minister of Britain, of course even in the Arab world. I mean the Arab world they know what the ideology, we are the only one Raymond, the only country almost in the world. The that United the, States. The United States. The administration of the United States. Is the only country that does not recognize the ideology. Uh -huh. The only one. You were just in Egypt. Yes. Uh, tell me what you did there. What did you learn there? You had very high-level conversations about just this, vetting. Absolutely. It was an exceptional, important meeting with the Minister of Religious Affairs. He's a top Islamic cleric. Two years ago, I've met with the other, mm -hmm. Sheikh al-Azhar. I asked him, can we vet? Can we go to an extreme vetting of ideology? He said, that's what we do. But you guys, you need to begin to make a distinction between the ideology and the community. Once you do that, you win. I told them, unfortunately, we're not there yet. Hmm. So we want them to come here and teach us how to do this uh, distinction and how to actually vet uh, the jihadists. A counterintelligent Lieutenant Colonel uh, Tony Schaefer has said 15% of these Syrian refugees have links to ISIS. Does that number strike you as excessive? I don't have numbers, but what I know is if you take a sample of the war, the civil war in Syria, mm -hmm. where there are studies that tell us how many Salafi jihadi are within the fighting force. I'm talking about the fighting force. The fighting force are young men able to do the war. So when you have a sample of migrants coming from a civil war, that's different from migrants coming from North Africa to work in France. That's a different mm -hmm. story. Mm -hmm. We're talking about people who have left their country because of the civil war. Obviously, there is a chunk. Now the major put it at 15%, other 10%, but those percentages translated into reality out of 10,000 or of 100,000, you will have jihadists, of course. Wow. 
That's scary. Uh, talk to me about the Trump diplomatic outreach that we saw this week at the U.N. You were there. Of course. And what, did, what happened? What did you hear? Well, first of all, uh, against the criticism that Mr. Trump is somebody who's isolated world You were forms. representing the Trump administration? Then? I am an advisor of mm -hmm. the Trump uh, campaign, of course. Okay. So when we meet with people, it means that people are want to talk to the campaign. We listen to them. That's mm -hmm. what we do, because we're not the administration, we're not right. the government yet. Right. Well, I can tell you, in addition to that major meeting with President of Egypt, that is the most important event, we have been meeting with ministers of foreign affairs and diplomats of dozens and dozens of countries, and they come to us and say, of course we meet with the other side, there's no doubt about it. We want to know about your ideas, the ideas of Mr. Trump. What would he do in the Middle East, in Africa, even in Argentina? I met with the foreign minister of Argentina, mm. of Tunisia, of many other countries, just a dialogue to get to, uh, to know what are the ideas and what their problems are. And what are they saying about the United States today? What are their challenges? Because if you, if you read the papers, it is Donald Trump represents a market departure and the whole world would simply turn the United States off should he be elected. That what did you is, discover? That's the propaganda machine of those who are challenging Mr. Trump in our elections. Mm -hmm. Because they have their friends and allies. I mean, our media, we know that our media, 80% of it is against Mr. Trump. So their allies around the world are carrying the same message. But when we, when we meet diplomats, heads of states, prime ministers, they tell us, will we have a change in your foreign policy because we had all these problems, five ongoing wars, crisis here, crisis with Russia. They are hungry to see if they have an, a, a different uh, alternative. Besides, in social media, it's not like in, in mainstream media. Mm -hmm. Ninety percent of social media is asking about will there be a change. Mm -hmm. I want to ask you for a moment about this Iran deal, uh, the, the payment deal. $1.7 billion the United States paid to the Iranian regime, this after paying $200 million plus. Some are saying this money was nothing more than a ransom. I want to show this to you. This is Speaker of the House Paul Ryan. He took the Obama administration to task about this controversial Iranian cash deal. Watch. First, there was a payment, but it had nothing to do with the hostages, pushing legal and ethical boundaries to appease this regime. Your thoughts? Speaker Ryan is absolutely right on this issue. Uh, those payments, first of all, they started even before the signing right. of the agreement, then through the signing. These are the payment requested by the regime as a condition for the regime to sign off. It's Im unbelievable that we had to pay them to sign, in a sense. Now, what did they do with that money? I mean, we have information that some of it was reinvested in the propaganda campaign against the United States, in the propaganda campaign against Israel, the Arab countries, and our allies. Well, in I was going to ask you, where does that money go? We shouldn't forget. We shouldn't lose sight. Iran is the number one exporter of terror around the globe. They foster it. They foment it. Where does that money go? Are we are we paying to import people, essentially, to come in and cause the kind of havoc we've been watching in the United States and Europe over the last few weeks? That's what our allies are telling us. Some of them even told me in the region. Mm. There are four wars that Iran is involved in, in Iraq, in Syria, in Lebanon, in Yemen, a propaganda war against the West. They are sending their ships, we've seen this on TV, to, 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 you know, to, to, to be around our own battleships, to show their public that they are strong and in control. Mm -hmm. They have converted some of that money into a propaganda machine. Second, are they not buying anti-missiles uh, uh, and then advanced weapons from Russia? So most of the money is not going to the poor people of Iran. It's going to the rich regime of Iran getting more weapons, and those weapons will be used against our allies and eventually against I want to tie something together or try to and just get your take on it. There may be no connection. We're seeing these riots in Charlotte. Now, these are obviously around the issue of race. Do you see a connection or possible exploitation that terrorist-minded individuals could use these flashpoints, race, for instance, to ignite a kind of major protests that would overwhelm law enforcement. The connection is not in out. So people who are part of these demonstrations, mm -hmm. at least the majority of them, that's what we understand, are not reaching out to international mm -hmm. foreign forces. But the out in is happening in the sense that if you go online 
and you look at what the Iranian propaganda, the Muslim Brotherhood propaganda, or the radical anti-American propaganda are saying, they're encouraging this. They're saying this is what we need to do to destabilize the government of the United States. More important, the fact is that jihadi, of course, are going to try to penetrate any of these acts of violence, not to adopt them, but to weaken the resolve of the United States, obviously. Before I let you go, Pope Francis and an array of religious leaders this week gathered in Assisi. They urged that the world come together and that interfaith dialogue take place as a means of stemming this terrorism that we're seeing all over the world. Is dialogue possible with these individuals who are perpetrating these acts of terror? I think His Holiness is talking about dialogue between religious spiritual leaders. That has nothing to do with the jihadists. The jihadists are in an army that is marching, including to topple these spiritual leaders. Besides, if you want to have a dialogue with these radical forces, we do it before they are indoctrinated. When there are civil societies and minorities, this is when we need to talk uh, to Can them. Can you have a civil society in some of these places now, given the destabilization in places like Syria, in Iraq? Basically, if you do not work beforehand, if you do not stop the jihadists from coming, it's going to be much more difficult. And at one point, it's going to be generational. It's going to take us 20 years. Very good. Walid Ferris, thanks for your insight, and uh, we'll have you back soon. Walid Ferris, most recent book, The Lost Spring, U.S. Policy in the Middle East and Catastrophes to Avoid, is available at bookstores everywhere. Up next, New Jersey Congressman Chris Smith will talk about migration and the refugee crisis. What of those Christian refugees and who is coming to the United States? We'll get into all of it when the world of Alive continues. Stay right there. As president, I've increased the number of refugees we are resettling to 85,000 this year, which includes 10,000 Syrian refugees, a goal we've exceeded even as we've upheld our rigorous screening. And I called for the summit because we all have to do more. That was President Barack Obama at the Leaders' Summit on Refugees at the UN on Tuesday. He is committed to bringing even more refugees to the U.S., even as bishops are calling for increased refugee resettlement. But what does the vetting process look like? And just who are these refugees? Joining me in studio is a senior member of the House Foreign Affairs Committee and a tireless advocate for human rights, New Jersey Congressman Chris Smith. Raymond, thank, thank you very thank much. Thank you for coming back. I want to start with this goal. Now, the president had a goal of 10,000 yeah. Syrian refugees coming to the U.S. He, as he said, blew past that goal. He brought in more than 11,491. Of that number, only 50 of those people, 50 refugees, were Christians. Why is that number so small, given that the State Department and this administration has defined Christians as being subject to a genocide in the you know, Raymond, for three years, and I've held seven congressional hearings uh, on the plight of the Christians, the Yazidis, the minority faiths uh, in both Iraq and in Syria. And we pushed hard. We had a House vote. Uh, at the end of the day, it was almost unanimous. We had both sides of the aisle saying, this is a genocide. There's an effort by ISIS to, to destroy in whole or in part uh, the Christian faith there, uh, beheading Christians, raping women. It's, it's beyond horrific. Uh, reluctantly, the president made the call. John Kerry announced it. Right. At his U.N. speech, I saw no mention of the genocide being committed against Christians and other minority faiths. Where was that? Uh, and then when you get down to, uh, the, you know, what is really happening on the ground. Right. Uh, I chaired a hearing today. The Christians are not getting food aid, humanitarian aid, medicines. Mm -hmm. 70,000 internally displaced people, uh, Christians and some Yazidis, <clears throat> in, the, in, the, in the diocese of um, uh, Erbil, and they're not getting any help. Zero dollars. The Knights of Columbus under Carl Anderson's mm -hmm. Unbelievably great leadership uh, has raised $11 million, total about $26 million from Caritas and others. Right. Uh, but that money is out. Mm. And you have all these people, winter fast approaching, uh, so the bill would prioritize humanitarian aid to those individuals so we don't see death as well as sickness. On the refugee part, as you point out so uh, uh, correctly, 
approximately 50 Christians. You know, here's what happens. Christians leave. They leave in whole communities. Right. Uh, they don't want to go to the they UN. They can't go to the refugee they camps. Don't, because they are despised. They, the women are hurt, even sexually assaulted. Mm -hmm. The men are ostracized or worse, beaten. Uh, so they stay away from these camps. Mm. And the only means or the major means of getting an admission here to the United States and an interview is through that method. I have asked repeatedly as far back as a year ago this October from, to the State Department representative at my hearing, why don't we reach out to the Christians? My new bill says declare them to be P2. It's a protected area. They still have to be vetted and made sure that they are who they say they are. Mm -hmm. uh, and it might be easier with Christians, with baptismal records, the fact that they've moved with, in communities. And, and that many and, times they're traveling with their pastor or members of the Who knows them. With them. So th there's a lot of good checks and balances to in ensure that the Christians are who they say they are. Not so sure when it comes to others coming out of these camps who happen to be Muslim. Well, you raise this point of vetting, and we've heard a lot about it this campaign. Uh, Donald Trump is saying we need extreme vetting. You heard Waleed Farah's mention it a moment ago. I want to play this for you. The, pr the president says we have a very competent vetting process in place. This is U.S. State Department spokesman John Kirby. He's talking about the vetting process for refugees. <clears throat> he spoke to Fox earlier this week. Watch. They are going through a very serious interagency vetting process, the, the most that any refugee goes through. Is it perfect? Can it be perfect? Can it be foolproof? Well, probably not. You know, they always He's, have the straw said, man yeah, argument. Yeah, it's not foolproof. They always have the straw man argument of, well, it's not perfect. We just want effective, mm -hmm. and it's not effective. Uh, you know, how do you know who it is that's presenting uh, it are who they say they are? Uh, there's, there's, there's a dearth or a total lack of supporting documentation. Uh, we've had a number of people who, even some who are naturalized, who, uh, like we recently had in Linden, we've had these other acts of, of so-called lone wolves. We have to be on our best game. And this idea, is so the president can go and say, I'm doing this and I'm doing that. Uh, we're doing this, you know, the, his speech at the UN. Again, he didn't talk about the Christians, yeah. completely left out and did not talk about the fact uh, that this is a genocide. What can Congress do, given the holes that we see in the vetting system, the lack of priority for the people who really are refugees yeah. in need of safe harbor, the Christians, the Yazidis, some of these other minorities? Can't Congress strip the appropriation? You've got a $2 billion refugee uh, appropriation. You could take that out of the next uh, annual budget, couldn't you? Well, a lot of the refugee money gets really co-mingled with the idea of refugee mm -hmm. provision of, of health care goes to the UNHCR, right. UN High Commissioner of Refugees. Uh, and frankly, you know what triggered the original mass exodus um, the last year, last summer? It was the fact that there was a huge cut by the international community, and that includes us, mm -hmm. to the World Food Program and to refugee assistance in country. Once, you know, a huge cut. And the 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 requests, or what they call them appeals, that went out uh, for the refugees, like, uh, you know, scattered throughout the Middle East, uh, they were coming in about 40% of what was needed. So the refugees sitting there said, we're out of here. We're not sure we can get enough food to eat. Our kids aren't getting an education. And began the mass migration. And once it became a walk, it became a stampede uh, into Europe. And, and that's why we're dealing in large part with this refugee crisis. People are not staying in place because of that lack of funding to help them live and get medicine and shelter. I want to put something up on the screen. The Pope this week had this to say. It was at a meeting with alumni from Jes Jesuit schools. He was in Rome. This is from Saturday. And Pope Francis was encouraging Europeans and, by proxy, <coughs> everyone in the world to welcome refugees into their homes. He said, Remember that authentic hospitality is a profound gospel value that nurtures love and is our greatest security against hateful acts of terrorism. Do you believe, Congressman Smith, that welcoming, <coughs> the problem is we're not welcoming enough refugees, and if we did that, the terrorism would stop? Well, we're a nation of immigrants. We're a nation of, of refugees. And refugees have come in from the Soviet Union, from the Warsaw Pact, China, Cuba, uh, and the Middle East uh, every year. And so it has been part, not the Soviet Union anymore, of course, but, but it has been part of 
America's legacy. We are a nation of immigrants as well as refugees. Right. But that doesn't in any way preclude the necessity of protecting the American people from people who wish us ill. We know that, that, that ISIS has said they seek to integrate their bombers and killers uh, with people who are making the, this trek. And they seem uh, to, to be countries. doing a good job in They've Europe. Also, a very good job, sadly, a mm -hmm. terrible job in terms yeah. of safety of Europeans. Uh, and so we've got to be extra vigilant. And the president, in my opinion, uh, just trivializes and almost makes fun of those who say protecting women and men and children in this, our families in America, that really has to come first. But again, then why does he exclude the Christians? Uh, I'm appalled at it. I've been asking these questions for three years, seven congressional hearings. And why are uh, they excluding the Christians? Well, one is that they can't get the admissions uh, um, um, uh, interview. So the that's Christians what my in bill the, would in change. The native country my bill would change it and say they're prioritized, just like we did with Soviet Jews, mm -hmm. just like we did with Christians in Ukraine, as well as Pentecostals and Catholics uh, throughout you know, the Soviet space. Mm -hmm. um, that is extremely important. This P2 status... They still have to be vetted, go through a process, mm -hmm. but it gives them a priority so they are able to. You know, the president, when he heard that we were pushing this, made a comment. This was several months ago. He doesn't want a religious test, somehow comparing it to a poll tax or something, which I think is outrageous. Mm -hmm. This isn't a religious test. These Christians have been singled out by ISIS for extermination. That you either Change your, your belief system, and this is the same with Boko Haram, Nigeria, and Al-Shabaab in Somalia. You gun to your head, change your, 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 your religion, or I'll kill you. That's the quintessential textbook definition of what genocide is all about. And, and the president has, you know, reluctant to make that designation, did it under duress. At my hearing in, in, the, in the spring, we call it the what's next hearing. And again, Carl Anderson did a wonderful job, as did our other uh, witnesses, in saying, here's what could be done to give voice, to, to give some real, you know, substance right. to the declaration. It's, you know, it can't be just be rhetorical. It has to be substantive. Month after month after month goes by. Where is the substance? My new bill prioritizes three major areas, getting food and humanitarian assistance, providing this this access way for Christians and Yazidis uh, and minority faiths to get that admissions interview, and thirdly, to prosecute and begin building. We have lots of evidence. Where's mm -hmm. the prosecution? And uh, two of our witnesses today were outstanding in talking about how the prosecution could make all the difference in the world. Well, it's hard to prosecute in a war zone, too. But you can take people out into mm -hmm. areas where you set up hybrid courts. There's all kinds of ways. Do you, you do support it. safe zones in Syria, in Iraq? How do you police them? See, the problem, you know, safe zones, and there's a, there's a lot of pro and con on a safe zone, mm -hmm. because you ask the absolute important question, how do you police it? You know, a lot of the Christians and others want to go back someday, which is why prosecution is important. We saw in the Balkans, during the Balkans War, so many people, when they went back to Bosnia and Serbska, uh, Republic of Serbska, their next-door neighbor was somebody who was killing people during the worst days of the war. No pros limited prosecution. So now it's, um, you know, so that, that's an important point. I've only got one minute sure. left. Before I let you go, what do you see as being at stake in this election cycle that we find ourselves in? Well, Hillary Clinton is the quintessential threat. She is the existential threat. What do you mean by that? To the unborn child no. in this country and around the world. She is the, she wants to get rid of the Hyde Amendment. The Hyde Amendment has barred Medicaid funding for abortion, uh, you know, for 40 years. Yeah. It has saved well over a million children who are now, many of them adults, having their own children. We know when there's no subsidies for abortion, that about 25% different estimates of the women do not go through with the abortion. It's not being facilitated by the state. Uh, and those children are born, and they go on to play soccer, get married, and go to school and everything else. She will push abortion globally in Africa, Latin America. Um, you know, the Sustainable Development Goals has language in it that says you want to ensure universal access to reproductive rights. She will use that as, as her entree to promote abortion globally. And every single pro-life law, state and federal, passed in the last uh, you know, decades 
will be at risk by a Supreme Court that she will pack with litmus-tested pro-abortion judges who will, if she doesn't do it by legislation or executive order, will eviscerate every pro-life policy we have. Anyone who votes for Hillary Clinton will be directly responsible for making the protection of unborn children nearly impossible, as well as, and this is important, Raymond, as well as conscience rights. Mm. The churches will be under siege as well as the hospitals. Congressman Smith, got to run. Thank you so much for being you, here. Raymond. We will check in with you in the days ahead. When we return, we'll discuss faith and motherhood and much more with three-time Olympian Dominique Dawes. You don't want to miss this when the world over continues. Stay right there. Now, once again, Raymond Arroyo. Welcome back to the World Over Live. My next guest is a three-time Olympic gymnast. She won four medals, including the gold. I sat down with her recently to talk about motherhood, her incredible career, the 2016 Rio Games, and the faith that has seen her through her entire life. We also talked a little bit about a certain cloistered nun that you and I know very well. Here's my exclusive interview with Dominique Dawes. Dominique Dawes, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having uh, and me. And returning to the show, this time without a baby. Yes, my two little ones are at home with Jeff, and he's doing all the heavy uh, lifting no, now. No, that, that's okay. We're going to give you some heavy lifting. You have said motherhood <laughs> is harder than the Olympics. How so? Oh, my goodness. I trained for three different Olympic Games when I was a young child, and it was a lot of a commitment in the gym day in and day out from 5 a.m. till nearly 8 p.m. at night. Mm. However, with my girls, it's 24-7. I have a two-and-a-half-year-old and then blessed to have another little girl who's now turning one very soon, and they keep me busy. They're very energetic children, and mm. as an Olympic athlete, we tend to be type A and very <laughs> controlling and <laughs> like to manage everything in our lives, and you really can't manage a, a toddler or an infant they the way break you break you right down. They will they? break you down, and they do that to me every day, but it's uh, this is the happiest time of my life. Wow. No, I, I see you. I follow you on Twitter. I see you on your trips and journeys yeah. with them. And, it makes your life full, though. It does. It, that's a great way to put it, because I will say that before I was happy and I was very fulfilled and I was pursuing my passions in life, and then I meet mm -hmm. Jeff, my husband, the man of my dreams, and, you know, someone that def definitely humbles me as well, and then we have these two beautiful girls right away, and, you know, I've never been happier and never been more challenged, and it's just a better me that comes out. Mm. We saw the Rio games. You were all over commenting. Yeah. You were doing special events. I mean, it was an amazing time. Yeah. When, when that... When the Olympics roll around, do you get a little nostalgic? I do, but now that I'm turning 40 very soon, I know that oh I should gosh, not put a leotard anybody. on. You, 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 you pass for half oh, of that. Well, no, I, I love it. announcing the fact that I'm 40. I'm looking forward to it. I know that there's a lot of women that are like, oh, I'm 40 or I'm 50 yeah. or they don't want to get older. But mm -hmm. I do feel as if each and every year I, I get a little wiser. I let go of a lot more junk in life, um, no. though my husband would lot, like me to let go of a lot more <laughs> things. Like, I tend to be considered a hoarder. Um, I love collecting things. Oh, you but no, I, you know, I, sentimental value, yeah, right? Well, you got to hold on to those memories I to give them to the you. Smithsonian exactly. later. But you, you actually <laughs> might give them yeah. to the well, Smithsonian. I, the, the, I won't. The Smithsonian actually had one of my Olympic Leos for many, many years. They've now since sent it back, and they've probably gotten Gabby's or Simone's now. But <laughs> you know, just turning 40 very soon, I love it, and I'm challenged, like I said, with my family every single day. And you know, it's just I've never been happier. Tell me, I read somewhere there was a particular verse, a Bible verse, that you brought to mind right before you went into competition. Tell me about that. Well, many times I would always, you know, get in my head and make sure I was understanding that my thoughts were going to control my body. My coach, Kelly, used to always say that your mind controls your body. So the best way to make sure that I was doing the things that I wanted to do was by this Bible verse, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And oh. this summer I was on Good Morning America daily speaking about the Olympic Games, and I brought that to mind because that's something to recognize that you're never alone, even on that balance board. Well, here's what's so weird, and that's, that's from Philippians 4, Four. okay? Yeah. A series of Olympic athletes, and I'll read the names, Gabby Douglas, mm -hmm. 
Lori Hernandez, yeah. Jake Dalton has it tattooed on his side. Oh, ow. Do you think they were inspired <laughs> by you? No, not at all. They were inspired by him. I mean, just recognize, I mean. I'm, I know, but I'm, you got a whole Bible. Yeah. How, what's the chances of the one verse being used by all these gymnasts? Well, gymnastics, many times people think it's a team sport, but it is an individual sport. And you are out there alone until you recognize that you have Jesus Christ on your side and to recognize that you are going to overcome this fear with his help. You are going to overcome this pain with his help. You are going to overcome this anxiety or this pressure with his help. And I know whenever I marched out at the Olympic Games, either in 92 at 15 years old, 96 at 19 or 2000, when I was over the hill and a grandmother, I was marching out um, with him on my side and recognizing it wasn't just me. What's it like? You look at Simone Biles, you look at so many women inspired by you. You were the first yeah. African-American to win a medal in gymnastics. Yeah. Yeah. Does it does it still sort of give you goosebumps? Um, it, it does. When you see these other women who followed in your footsteps. Um, it is a surreal experience to know that um, by not quitting, not giving up, always believing, having the right people on my in my corner, like my coach, mm -hmm. my teammates that picked me up. I wanted to quit all the time. It was a very difficult sport, but my teammates were there for me. That by not quitting, I was able to inspire a few generations of gymnasts to reach their full potential and overcome what I was able to, unable to accomplish. So, you know, I got an opportunity to meet Simone Biles this summer, and oh. I will say the highlight is the fact that my young daughter, Katiri, now always is talking about Simone Biles. Really? And doing cartwheels, too. She's two uh -huh. and a half, and she's like a self-taught gymnast well, doing cartwheels. The genes, you know, it's in the blood, it's they from, say. It, Jeff thinks it's from him. Yeah, oh, well, yeah. of course he would, but <laughs> I think we yeah. know better. Uh, let's talk for a second about the display of faith we saw, particularly at this Olympics. Mm -hmm. uh, Katie Ledecky and some of the, the gymnasts we talked about, the other athletes, faith seemed to be a big part of this. Why does it loom so large? Um, and, and why do you think athletes are more willing to talk about their faith than perhaps people in other professions? Um, I don't know. I think it's good that faith hasn't been taken out of sports. You know, I mean, it's an individual or team um, component, and people recognize that sports can be very challenging at times, and sometimes it's just you in that gymnastics gym, and you need to lean on someone, and that someone that's always there is Jesus. So I, I really can't speak personally for Katie Ledecky or Jake Dalton or Lori Hernandez or Gabby, but I will say that faith is really um, what got me through. Faith is really what helped me um, persevere and not quit. I mean, I was going through many difficult personal things in the sport of gymnastics. My parents got divorced, um, yeah. you know, just challenging uh, periods of abandonment and just low self-esteem. Yeah. And when I would lean on Christ, I always felt um, more whole. Supported. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I came across something. In fact, I'm, I'm on a plane. I remember this distinctly. And on my phone, I'm getting all these pings coming in yeah. from journalists, from friends, because the New York Times has a series they run mm -hmm. called Breaking Bread. Mm -hmm. And it asks prominent people, particularly athletes like yourself, if you could choose anybody who's left us, yep. a dead person, who would you choose to have dinner with? Yep. And Dominique Dawes says? Mother Angelica. Why? Well, my best friend is my husband, and so I'm always consulting with him, like, oh, you know, let's let's think, who would I wh who would I want to dine with? And, you know, I'm that kind of person where, you know, um, not always trying to get something from someone, but, you know, just reading her story and knowing that she dealt with abandonment from her father mm -hmm. and, um, you know, certain personal struggles and pain and how she was able to give that up and offer that up to Christ. I was like, I need to learn from this young lady um, because I've dealt with some moments of abandonment and I've dealt with some pain and some suffering. And mm -hmm. I do feel as if my pain, my, my passion um, is to help empower people and encourage people. And she was able to do that. And so, mm -hmm. you know, I thought, you know, what, why not? I'd love to dine with Mother Angelica. And she, you know, as you probably wrote, um, read in the piece, I, you know, I want to make my chitlins. You know, yeah, well, that's what I, I was going to ask you. Tell I, people about the the dinner you would yeah, you would set for her, yeah. and then I'll I'll give you my reaction when I yeah, read that. You're tell, like, oh, tell people, yeah. What was on the menu? Well, my favorite food when I was a kid was chitlins. My mom used to cook chitlins. You know, I grew yes. up on soul food. I right. you know, that's how she grew up. And so when my mom would ask me what I wanted for dinner, I was like, I'll che I'll clean the chitlins. And right. so Mother Angelica grew up with poor blacks and poor Italians, she and did. so she would appreciate and she would enjoy some. Chitlins. Well, not only that, when she was in Birmingham, mm -hmm. 
she had, there, was a, there, there were two ladies, uh, Willie Mae and, and Rosie, whom I remember distinctly, uh, who would cook for her when she was doing the show, before, yeah. only before she did the show, otherwise she ate in her monastery. Yeah. But, and they made a lot of soul food mm -hmm. and southern cooking, yeah. so she would feel it's, right at home at it's your good, table. It's good food, and that's why I eat a, a lot of vinegar and hot sauce on many of my foods. But <laughs> the other thing is, is um, she was a cloistered nun, mm -hmm. and I, by nature, am introverted. And my husband has mm. told me that I many times have isolated myself, many times because I didn't have very much trust. When you deal with abandonment issues, you have trouble trusting. And mm -hmm. that's what I read from her, that the abandonment issues and that she had to overcome and yeah. then to learn to trust. And so that's what Well, I you to wrote learn. at one point and that you would ask her, how were you able to embrace both of these very opposite vocations, the being a cloistered nun and being on television and leading this network. Exactly. Is that something you grapple with? I do, I do. I am by nature an introvert, and yet I was thrust into the Olympic spotlight at 15 years old. And I do love people. It's not that I don't love people, but I love a very small group of individuals. And yet, mm -hmm. throughout these years, not only on the Olympic stage, but then finding my next passion in life and empowering others and motivational speaking that I've spoken to hundreds and thousands. And yet, mm -hmm. I do always feel a little bit of anxiety or nervousness, but it's an ex there's an excitement there that I I do embrace just knowing that I can make a difference. And mm -hmm. I wanted to know how she was able to embrace and make such a large, large impact in both of her different lives. You know, lives. when I asked her, how do you transition between those yeah. two states in life? Because yeah. she would run. She'd go from teaching her nuns in the monastery, then she'd come out, she'd have meetings with the people at EWTN, yep. do a live show, and then she was back in the monastery. Yeah. I yeah. said, how do you do that? She said, you don't bring one world into the other. Okay. You drop that hat. Yep. And you do the next thing in the present moment, and when that's over, you drop it. Yep. She said, I have a dew drop system. Okay. I do it, and, and I drop, drop it. it. A dew drop <laughs> system. Go I'm going to take one. that. I'm going to so take I'll that. I'll have to give you the little book of life lessons has all these great okay. spiritual nuggets that she gave me, but they speak to a lot of the questions you, you yeah, raised fabulous. in the column. Great. It was a great piece. Oh, thank uh, before you. I let you go, would you encourage your daughters, ah. should they show an interest? to pursue an Olympic career? Oh, not necessarily an Olympic career. I'm glad you said it okay. that way. Gymnastics, yes, it is a beautiful sport. It'll mm -hmm. give you a healthy, strong foundation for mm -hmm. many other sports that one may pursue. Flexibility, coordination, balance. Um, strength, balance, mm -hmm. exactly, is wonderful. But the Olympic pursuit, it takes a unique individual, a unique person, personality with the right coach and the right environment. Mm -hmm. And it really does force you to put your faith and family somewhat in the background, on the, the back background a little bit because as I was a young person, you know, when gymnastics wasn't going well for me, it was the end of my world because gymnastics was my world. Yeah. And so I do not um, maybe wish the Olympic pursuit for my two daughters, but mm. if they have the talent and they have the uh, the focus and the drive, then I'll be there to support them. Mm. I love uh, having you on. Thanks uh, for being here. This you. is why they call you Awesome Dawson. Oh, it's been many years. They no, I that. still call you Awesome oh, Dawson, and there are a lot of people who oh, do. Thank, thank you, you for being here, Dominique. What a pleasure. Before we go, I want to share this video with you. It comes from Trey Murnane in Whitesboro, New York. He recently read my Will Wilder, The Relic of Perilous Falls book, and he sent me this video. I really loved your book, Will Wilder, The Relic of Perilous Falls. My favorite part was when Will, Andrew, and Simon were trapped in the undercroft of the church. I can't wait for the next book. Thanks for writing. Bye. Trey is the winner of a Will Wilder audiobook. Great job, Trey. I'm extending the contest by one more week. Details are at RaymondArroyo.com. Well, that is all the time we have until then. The show continues on Facebook and Twitter. Find me on Facebook. Follow me on Twitter. The links are at RaymondArroyo.com. Next week, candidate for the U.S. Senate from New York, Wendy Long will join us and much more. Looking forward to seeing you at the National Book Festival. Until then... We'll be scouting the world over for all that is seen and unseen. On behalf of the staff and crew of EWTN News, thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time. Bye now.